predictive behavior. And again, we're going to talk about this in a way that's going to naturally land at your feet. And we're going to keep right on coming until we get on your street. Okay? Come on in. Get a seat. Come on in. We got space. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for every person that's here. We know it's no accident that we're in this place. So God, we're asking that you open up our hearts. You open up our minds. You open up our ears. You open up our eyes so that we can see, so that we can hear, so that we can receive. And that we'll leave here differently than we came in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Addiction monitor. You know, like it, want it, need it, crave it. And I used to tell the young people when I was a youth pastor, you know, nobody just wakes up one day and say, you know what I want to be when I grow up? I want to be a crackhead. Mm -hmm. Who says that? Nobody. Here's the thing. Nobody says that, but what happens? They start out with a little cigarette. They start out with a little beer. Then they start with some liquor. Then they smoke in a joint. Then they need the next high, the next high, the next high, until they're a full-blown addict. Nobody says, I want to steal my grandmama's TV. Nobody says that's what they want to do, but what happened, they get into this behavior that they're not even in control of their choices anymore. I was at a class, and I'm using this because when we think addiction, the first thing we want to think about is drugs, but you just hold on a minute. And they talked about how at the, and I think it might be meth or one of these drugs, what happens is when you are craving it, your body will start to send signals to your brain that will make it think it will die if it doesn't get it. It's so powerful that literally you believe that the next hit will save you. That's the power of drugs. That's the power of addiction. Because I've seen the people who were beautiful whose teeth had rotten out whose body had been dinged up with needles, beautiful or handsome people who fell to the trap of addiction. And when we look at society, we think about alcohol, we think about drugs, and we think that that's the only addiction that can steal from you, and that's a life in the pit of hell. And as we talk through tonight's lesson, again, I'm going to preface this by saying, you might not like me, but it's so okay because I still love you. But the truth is the truth, and the lie is a lie. And what you choose to do with it. Miss Sandra said she gave me full permission to tell the truth. Because she said some people just hard-headed and they need it this way. It. It's in the Bible. Hello, Miss Sandra said she took it from the Bible. That's what's up. We are We're hard-headed people. And so I'm coming with you tonight, for you tonight, with a truth truck. So just look around and just say, she coming. She coming. Consider yourself warned. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And I'm giving you guys a lot of words tonight, a lot of notes, and we're hitting it from a couple different perspectives. But I want to make sure by the time we finish up that you've seen yourself in our text. Verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Say it again. And against such things, there is no law. So let's talk about self-control for a moment. We just saw it in the text, right? It says the fruit of the Spirit. So when you think about it, self-control is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that he'll produce in the believer's life if he's allowed to feel the believer through and through. Self-control is produced if you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, right? If you allow the Holy Spirit to do in you what only he can do. God wants us free from outside control and sealed by the inner control of his spirit. The Bible teaches us to control our thoughts, our mouths, and our actions. Miss Sandra already said to us, even during corporate prayer, before we were getting ready to get into this word, that we are hard-headed people. Right? And the Bible tells us that through the power of God, through the Holy Spirit, we can control our thoughts, our mouths, and our actions. And I'm not going to ask you yet if you are. But doesn't the Bible say that you can? Right? Okay. Because I know a lot of us say we can't. I can't help myself. I just have to say it. I just have to do it. Oh, maybe not, y'all. Okay, let's go to inner control. Inner control. I told you it's not going to take me long. 
going to give you some word on this. 1 Corinthians 9.19 says, I am free in every way from anyone's control. Think about it. It tells you that you're free. I gave you the verses, but I want you to go back and look at the text. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, I'll not become the slave of anyone or be bought on his power. All right? 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, Each one should know how to manage his own body. That's not Keisha. That's word. So this inner control that we have access to the power of the Holy Ghost is available to anyone who believes. So this is why I have a problem when someone says I'm a believer, but they say I can't operate with control. And I don't expect y'all to talk to me, and it's so okay. I'm fine. I got my, I'm so good. I don't expect y'all to, to laugh, and I don't expect a whole lot of, I'm just saying. I don't expect no, ooh, that's so good. No, it's going to, ouch. That's what it's going to do. But that's what, the, I gave you these scriptures, right? Right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So here's the thing. More people are out of control than in control. So true. Because of addictive behavior. More people live their lives out of control than in control. And I'm talking about people who say they got Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. Yeah. Woo! Jesus. I'm talking about the ones who say, wait a minute, for me, you know what, I'm going to serve God all the days of my life and, you know, for God I live and for God I'll die. I'm talking about the ones who go to church on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I'm talking about the ones who pay their tithes. I'm talking about the ones who try to do, they are living more out of control than in control. And I'm not talking about you. I know this from me. I'm not coming without first having to look in my own mirror and deal with some of my own behavior. This morning as I was going back through this, I sat across the table, 6 o'clock this morning, talking to my husband. And we were talking through the text and I was talking through these things. And he said to me, you know what, Keisha? I was going through some of the lists of the things I was going to be talking about, and I actually wrote it right here in my notes. He says, Keisha, what does addiction look like? Because when people think, this is, these are Eric's direct words to me, because when people think of an addict, they automatically think of someone out of control. The more extreme example of addiction, drugs, sex, someone who's in constant turmoil and can't get enough, always wanting more, However, after I finished talking to him, he says, what I realized is more of us have more addiction issues than we care to admit. Oh, that's true. Because we immediately assume, I got to have it, got to have it. You know, we think about that next hit. And that's where our mind settles, not realizing we got our own personal stuff that we are addicted to. So I went to Mr. Webster. And he, had, he defined addiction for us. And the first thing was the one that we automatically think about. A compulsive, chronic, physiological, psychological need for a habit-forming substance, behavior, or activity having harmful effects and typically causing well-defined symptoms upon withdrawal or abstinence, right? Yes. That's what we automatically think about. Somebody going through DTs or somebody not having alcohol or somebody not having drugs and them getting into that place. The second definition I wanted to spend some time on. It says a strong inclination to do, use, or indulge in something repeatedly. An inclination to indulge in something. So y'all know me. I'm a word person. So I went and looked at it. I broke down those words that were in those definitions. Compulsive means automatic, chronic, deep-rooted. Psychological, internal, mental, physiological, fleshy, physical, habit forming, some form of consistency. But I went down to inclination and indulge. Inclination is a tendency. It's a bend towards something. Indulge is to give into a desire. You see where I'm coming? If we can talk about that compulsive, you know, that chronic, all that habit forming, but that second one talking about a tendency, a bend to give into a desire. And the reality is if we stop and we think, every person in this room got some tendencies that they're bending toward that's not of God. They've got some desires that they give into that feeds their flesh and not their spirit. The problem is we put a band-aid on it and we're critical of what everybody else's is instead of pulling back the veil and dealing with our own. Mm -hmm. We point fingers and we blame other people 
for our issues. We blame other people and then we don't want to deal with our own jealousies and our own insecurities. It's somebody else's fault that you didn't get the promotion, but you ain't qualified. It's somebody else's fault that your feelings are hurt, but we got to be operating with maturity. It's somebody else's fault that you got overlooked when you should have realized who you were in the first place. Why are you looking to them to see you when he sees you? So when we talk about an addiction, you know, I saw this and I thought about it. I never knew I was addicted until I tried to stop. I never knew I was addicted until I tried to stop. And as I got into this lesson, you know, I have never been a drug addict, but I had several in my family. And so one of the things that being around addicts did was drive me far from drugs, but all it did was push me into other addictions. They may not have been drugs, but they were still addictions. They ended up controlling me. They impacted the way I made decisions. They impacted the way I saw things. They infiltrated my views. They contaminated my thinking. So no, I may not have been addicted to a drug, but I had picked up a substitute drug to meet my own needs, to pacify, to direct me instead of dealing with some things. So here's the thing I want to ask you. Are you a functioning addict? Mm. Yeah. I was. See, my addiction, when you think about it, I was addicted to perfectionism. I was addicted to self-doubt. I, I was addicted to criticism, especially of myself. I was addicted, you know, let's be real, real. I've had, I got food addictions that I have to deal with. I mean, so there are things that we're dealing with, and you know what, what we don't realize, and I'm trying to set the tone, I'm starting with me, but I'm coming for you, is that these choices impacted me mentally. They impacted me emotionally. They impacted me physically. They impacted me financially. I didn't realize that I was a food addict until I started bodybuilding and I took certain foods out of my diet. And I, didn't, I would wake up smelling it. My body would crave it. It would literally hurt for it. I remember coming in my house like, who's cooking that? And everybody, like, nobody's cooking anything. I would smell stuff in my head. <laughs> I'm like, do y'all smell that? And Aaron's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I know y'all smell that. Who brought that in this house? And he's like, baby, what? I, would, I remember, y'all, when I really went clean and I took everything out of my diet I shouldn't be eating, I would wake up in the middle of the night in panic attacks. Mm -hmm. wow. And all I changed was what I was eating. Wow. And what, what I, when I was going back to this lesson, why I thought about this is I took out the things out of my diet that I didn't need. The things that weren't good for me are what I deprived myself of and my body tortured itself because it wanted what it didn't need. Mm. I was feeding it the green smoothies and the healthy stuff, but it wanted sugar. Mm. It wanted carbs. And it fought me to try to make me think I couldn't make it without it. And as I studied and I thought about this lesson, if my body did that over carbs, what do you think your body is doing to you over sin? Mm -hmm. Whoa, that's deep. What is your mind doing to you to rob you of the thing that God has for you to keep you trapped in something else? If, if an Oreo cookie had me about wanting to lose my mind, <laughs> an Oreo just, I remember sitting there saying, I could just, just one. You know, Chris, I'd be like, just one. I don't got to eat the whole row. But one, how many, one, then you look on the back, 130 calories for one cookie. What in the world? I mean, I literally, I had to put myself in timeout. Because you know, you find yourself rocking. 
Yeah. I remember just going to bed some nights at 6 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> just getting in the bed. Every time I'm going to bed, I'm going to bed. I drank my water, I ate my cucumber, I'm going to bed. It was controlling me. And I had not even thought about that. That was about six years ago when I did all that. I hadn't even thought about it until I start going back through this lesson. But then I realized how easily we get lulled to sleep and rocked into addictive behavior that's killing you. And we choose death over life. And then we want to sing songs of praise. We bring sacrifice to praise. Woo, woo. But you're killing yourself. But then we're killing ourselves. Woo. I'm coming for you. Says she coming. Okay, types of addictive behavior. I'm already there. Okay. I put your definition over here so y'all keep seeing it. A strong inclination to do, use, or indulge in something repeatedly. Inclination, tendency to bend, indulge, to give into a desire. I want to make sure we get that. So we're going to hit a few of them, right? The first one, everybody says, well, yes, alcohol, drugs, and smoking, right? Yeah. We all know that, and we automatically think that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. If I don't have an alcohol issue, I'm not an addict. If I don't have a drug issue, I'm not an addict. If I don't have a smoking issue, I'm not an addict. Thanks to God, all three are the same. <laughs> well, you're Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. But you know what? That's a testimony of she said she was, and it's what she did, but it's not who she is. Because her words were, thank be to God, thanks be to God that I'm not bound by it anymore. But here's the thing. Number two. Yeah. Food addictions. <laughs> now, let me give you some stats. This is sad, y'all. 60% of women and 50% of men are overweight. Yep. Experts say that 15 pounds of excess weight qualifies a person as obese. Oh. 15 pounds. I ain't say 50. 15, Caitlin. I see your face. That's exactly what I said. 15 pounds. It's 15. I'm not going to ask you to weigh in. But here's what we do, y'all. You know how we justify our 15? Hold on. Come on with me. Dawn, you cut the heat on and now you wish you didn't. I'm just yeah. saying. <laughs> here's what we do. Our excuse is being what a, hold on. Here we go. Hold on. Wait, wait. Before it. I got a glam problem. Yes, I'm doing. It's hereditary. Hereditary, excuse me. It's aging. I have, I have, it's my children. Your children are 36 years old. How you still got baby fat? You know, I got big bones. I, I done seen a whole bunch of skeletons, and they all the same size. I'm just saying. You know, I'm, I'm a social eater. No, you're an emotional eater. You know, we, tell, we sell our 15 pounds on everything. Wow. Y'all know we do. We take food. Yeah, that's She's the and it ain't 15 pounds worth. Yeah, yeah, because if that's the case, we need to go put a whole pair of holes up to you and let it drain out. Yeah, sure. But we justify our food addictions, but then we'll say this is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Woo! Jesus. That's like me not putting in it what I need. How about this? Me going to the gas tank and filling my gas tank up with water mm -hmm. and expecting it to run mm -hmm. and to get me where it's supposed to take me to fulfill its purpose. True that. Oh. Was 15 percent a percentage? 15 pounds. 15 pounds. 15 pounds. 15 pounds over the weight that you're supposed to be is considered obese. Oh, yeah. So but number three, fat and thin disorders. That's when you talk anorexia, self-starvation, bulimia, binge purging. And here's the thing, people are like, well, I don't do that. But you know what? You take laxatives because you're trying to weigh in at work. <laughs> Got people addicted to exercise, that forced vomiting. Mm -hmm. Then you got people who do excessive fasting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Five. This is what I'm coming for you. Five. Them feeling addictions. Woo! Oh. Okay. <laughs> feeling addictions. What is it? Those are rage, sadness, fear, excitement. Religious righteousness. Yeah, okay. You know, the joy addicts, the one that says, oh my God, everything's always great. There's never a problem. Life is wonderful. Yay, yay. Woo! Woo! But then you have the other ones. Hold on. Wait a minute. Let's go to the other side. How you doing? Horrible. Life sucks. 
just raining outside. I ain't got no money. I ain't got no gas in my car. So think about it. Hold on. So feeling addictions. So you are addicted to how you feel, and it controls your world. And then what's so sad, you want to bring that in somebody else's world and contaminate it because you got an addiction issue. Oh, wow. So because you feel crappy, the room's supposed to feel crappy. Because you're looking at your life and you're not enjoying the journey, so nobody's supposed to enjoy their journey. You mad, so I'm supposed to be mad. You sad, so I'm supposed to be sad. You happy, so I'm supposed to be happy. Look, what are you got much power over me? Feeling addictions. Yeah. I'm coming for you. Number five. You got these thought addictions. What do I mean? Worrying. Yes. Lust. Fear. How about this one? Non-stop talking. Because you don't want anybody to really think about what you got going on. Got all of it. All of it. All of it. So here's the thing. You are literally addicted to that. Think about people addicted to details. Yeah. Addicted to worrying. When life starts getting good, oh my God, what's wrong? What's about to happen? They're addicted to worrying. Jesus. Okay, coming for you. Number six, you got these activity addictions. What am I doing? I'm buying, I'm hoarding, I'm gambling, I'm exercising too much, I'm watching too much TV. Then this is one I read about. You got excessive pets. You got 12 cats and two dogs, some birds and some hamsters. Why? Because you want to check out a reality and play with your pets. So you want to be busy. That activity I'm hoarding, that getting, that buying, that having. Your kids don't need 1,233 activities. And then you want to tell me you're so busy and I'm supposed to feel sorry for you. Not going to happen. Okay, we good? Am I still, I need to keep coming? I need to come, oh, coming a little bit stronger. Number seven, you got these wheel addictions. What is this? I want what I want when I want it. I'm self-centered. As long as I'm getting my way and I'm in control, then everything is fine. Can't nobody hurt me. Then the opposite extreme of this wheel addiction is, wait a minute, I'm going to give you all my power so I don't have to think. You be the boss of me. So the other is, you know, I just, as long as I'm in control, as long as I'm calling the shots, as long as I'm getting in my way. People are addicted to that. Which is why people don't do change well. They don't do transitions well because, oh my gosh, wait, I'm not in control. I thought God was in control. Here you are trying to have your will. I thought his will. Okay. I'm coming. Am I, have I got there yet? Not yet. Keep going. Okay, keep going. Number eight, these reenactment addictions. Oh, what that is. That means, wait a minute, let me help you. Hold on, bring it in. That means I was abused as a child, so now I abuse other people. Oh. I was hurt as a kid, so now I'm going to transfer my hurt. I'm going to keep reenacting what I went through. Oh. I got abused. I got mistreated. Or somebody would do me wrong and then give me expensive gifts. So now I don't mind when people do me wrong as long as they buy me something. Oh. So then you just reenact what was done. You transfer abuse. You transfer hurt. You transfer pain. So you keep reenacting it. Mm. So, uh, are there a few up here that you ain't thought about? Keep, don't just, don't, don't raise your hand. But did you feel like I felt when I was going back to this lesson this morning with my husband? Because, because you find yourself in a fear. Mm -hmm. So, what I realized after going through this is we all know we got addictive behavior. So, how I, how dare I judge you? How dare I try to look at the, the speck in your eye when I got a light pole sticking up out of mine? How is it I how do I go to Cabriana and talk about Aaron's problems when I should be dealing with my own? Why do I go to Nicole and talk about what they got going on when I should be getting to my daddy and talking about what I got going on? See what I realize is everyone is prone, prone to bending towards something because we live in a fallen world and you want to find something that's familiar, that's comfortable. So what will happen is you'll drift to the one that you're vulnerable to. Mm -hmm. Oh. You'll drift to the one that will satisfy you. You'll drift to the one that you think you can get away with. Ooh. And you can cover it up and don't nobody know because you still look churchy. 
You still show up and don't nobody know what you got going on because don't nobody know you're addicted to porn because we haven't been through your browser. Don't mind about knowing how addicted you are to food because we don't get to see you throw it up. Get it? Feed us. We need it. So here's what I put these up here, y'all, because here's the reality. We need help. Yeah, we do. Do, do you understand that you need the help of the Holy Ghost? Yes. You've got to be a sheep. <laughs> you need a shepherd. And here's what's amazing, y'all. I thought about this, and then I had a conversation earlier today. You know, God tells us to be the dumbest animals on the planet. A sheep, you realize if he fall over, he'll die. If somebody don't, if he don't come along and pick him up, he can't even get himself back over. If he falls over like that, he can't. He ain't got good enough sense to put himself back up. Why do you think the shepherd has the staff? The staff, he'll get him. And I saw it on the video. I'm like, is that for real? And they have to flip them back over. They can't even turn themselves back over. So then think about it. That's what we're saying. Why? Because he knew we were a mess. We don't even know how to un take ourselves out of situations. Which is when we have to realize that, guess what? Yeah, these might be things that plague us. I was talking to someone a couple weeks ago, and I shared with them, you don't get to choose your temptation. What tempts me and what tempts Dawn may be different. I don't get to choose my temptation, but I do get to choose my response. That's true. See, I'm not tempted to drink. Why? Because I grew up with tons of alcoholics. Yes. But I am tempted to suffer from road rage if given the opportunity. Hello. <laughs> I'm working on a thank God for grace. And I've come a long way. I don't fuss as bad. I just put my hands down. But I'm tempted. That's a temptation. If people, if everybody was carrying guns, I was the type of person back in the day put their window down. What? Do you see, what you doing? Hello? I, I don't do that no more because people carry guns and stuff. So I'm just like, hey. <laughs> but that my temptation isn't drugs. But my I have my own. And if it weren't for the grace of God, it could be something else. And we have to be mindful of that. So what am I getting to? You know what? What those temptations and those addictions, those are real. And we need to be mindful of them, but we need to understand that the only way out is through. Amen. Isaiah 43, 1 through, two, 1 through 2 says, don't fear, you're mine. When you go through the fire, I'll be with you. If you saw yourself on that list and you know you're there, the only way to get through it is to realize you're not alone. Mm. Hebrews 6, 11 says, be diligent to sear all the way through so that you can realize and enjoy fullness with the Lord. you got to go all the, through it. You can't ignore it. You have to go through it. You can pass it back or you can pass it on. Ephesians 6, 12 says, give it back. The problem and its results to the devil where it came from. Send it back to hell where it came from. You got to recognize where the temptation's coming from. You got to recognize where the temptation and where the pressure and where the desire is coming from. You also got to learn where to place the blame and then move forward. See, what will happen, I mentioned this earlier, we'll spend so much time blaming everybody else instead of realizing, wait a minute, I opened up the door for the enemy. Yeah. Amen. I allowed them to get under my skin. Amen. Yes. I started comparing. I started criticizing. I started doubting. I got in fear. Yes. Realize where the blame goes and stop putting it on everybody else. Because mm -hmm. when people come to me, and let me just tell you, and all they want to do is roll out excuses, I may not say it out loud, but what my forehead is saying is shut up. <laughs> I may not say it out loud, but my, I, the, the forehead not start coming because I don't want to hear about your excuses. Own the crap. What'd you do? What didn't you do? How should you handle it? If you made a mistake, call it that. If you didn't do what you're supposed to do, own it. But don't be shooting and trying to blow smoke up my hind parts because here, place the blame where it belongs and then move forward. That's 
sure. Because what, t what happens to me is when you're not placing the blame in the right place, all it's showing is how immature you are. Because it's everybody else's fault. Last time I checked, you were pretty darn grown. <laughs> or close to it. Yeah. So you can't be 46 still blaming it on your mama. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Mm -hmm. You got to get to a point where, wait a minute. I could be mad at my mom. But I also need to recognize the enemy was trying to use my mom to get to me. Ooh, I can still be blamed, mad at my dad, but I can recognize that the enemy kept, tried to steal from him early on, and so then it tried to transfer to me. Yep. I can still be mad at my sister. I can still be mad at my spouse. I can be mad at my ex. I can be mad at the world. Or I can choose to move forward. What happens is we get stuck in those temptations, and we get stuck in those addictions, and we die there. What do I mean? Your dream, mm -hmm. your purpose, your vision, your hope. It dies there. And then you get mad at everybody else who's moving forward. I don't know who they think they are. Why they think they're better than everybody. Mm -hmm. If you got your truck out of park and put your foot on the gas, you can move forward too. But instead of moving forward, you want to move your mouth. <laughs> no quick fixes. I'm almost done. Coming around here. No quick fixes. There are no quick fix methods to eliminate the problems of addictive behavior. But there is an answer. Jesus said, I am the way. He's your way through. John 14, 6. So what are your next steps? And I'm done. We're going to talk. We're going to take communion because some of y'all need to talk to Jesus. <laughs> some of you need to talk to Jesus. Because you're up here pacifying stuff and making excuses for yourself and just playing games and mad at the world and, you know, mad at the government and, you know, still trying to figure out how somebody did you wrong. Yeah, they did you wrong, but are you going to stay there? Are you going to let somebody else's bad decision sentence you? Or are you going to move forward? Next step. Say next step. Next step. One, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. James 5.16. Confess your faults. You need to find somebody that you trust. And here's the thing. Nicole, let me tell you this. I'm going to look at you on this one. I don't need to be talking to Nicole about nobody's business but mine. I don't go to, go to Nicole and confess Ellen's faults. Mm -hmm. That's gossip. Go ahead. Ooh, Jesus. I don't go to Nicole and talk about Miss Sandra. That's immaturity. Mm -hmm. That's like 12 year old behavior. Mm -hmm. When I go to Nicole, I go to Nicole with my issues. Mm -hmm. If I got caught with Nicole, I go to Nicole with what I think I've done. Mm -hmm. And if I'm wrong, so that we can set that right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what happens is we want to go to people about everybody else's business. Grow up. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. My healing only comes when I'm honest with Nicole about Keisha. Amen. That's good. About where I'm struggling, about my weaknesses, about the things that I can control and what I need to do. I don't need to go to her puffed up and haughty and how great I am. I need to go to her humbly and say, I'm struggling, sister. Mm -hmm. That's good. That is good. I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time with this. I'm having a hard time forgiving. I'm having a hard time letting go. I'm having a hard time not going back to my old ways. And then it's her job to be my keeper. Amen. That's a keeper of what I share with her because it ain't her business to tell. Amen. A keeper of my heart, which means she's now covering me because love covers. And a keeper of my accountability. Because when I go disclose it to her, it's her job to help pull me up by challenging me to the next level. See, what happens is you want to go to people that will let you keep cycling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. And then what will happen, you talk, and I go to Nicole and all my problems, all my issues, and then I'm going to come back and sit on your porch next week and pick right back up where I left off. Is that okay? I'll bring, this, I'll bring the drinks. You get cookies, Okay. <laughs> So you just keep cycling. So what will happen, you, need, you got people in your life that will just keep saying, okay, pause, and we'll pick back up next week. Mm -hmm. You need people in your life that will punch the brake and say, hold up. <laughs> Do you hear you? Mm -hmm. Do you hear how crazy you sound? Mm -hmm. Well, if you come to me, that's what I'm going to say. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, look, I know what the facts say. 
say, I get the facts, but what does the truth say? Mm -hmm. Who gets the last report? What do you believe? Not in a condescending kind of way, but in a challenging kind of way. Because sometimes you need to be snatched up out of yourself. Yes. Jesus. Confess your faults one another that you may be healed. <laughs> Commit to do the work as unto the Lord. Colossians 3.23. Do what you got to do to come up out of it. Quit playing patty cake with the devil. Because mm. what will happen, he'll start out just kind of sashaying with you oh, yeah. until he takes the lead. Mm. So you got to commit to do the work of breaking free, of dealing with the addiction. For me, dealing with this thing, because I was addicted to perfectionism. You know why? Because I grew up in an unstable household, and I knew the parts I could control or what I could control. So I wanted what I could do perfect. My grades had to be perfect. My papers had to be perfect. My ba Everything had to be perfect because my life at home was so crazy. So I started putting myself into that. But what I realized is that I wasn't doing any of that as unto the God. I was doing that to pacify Keisha. Yep. It was my safe place instead of him being my refuge. Mm -hmm. So what do I have to do? I had to start letting myself have permission to not do it all just right or to realize that there are other ways and to be open. I had to learn how to start delegating and letting other people do stuff. Even if they didn't do it my way or they didn't do it the way I wanted it done, I had to start releasing some of that. And it's still uncomfortable, it's but I'm learning. It's hmm? overwhelming to be, try to be perfect, perfect. Here's the thing, and ain't for one perfect one. It'll kill you. Yeah. Because you can check in and check it twice and it's some life happens. You literally are setting yourself up for failure because you will be working at it being a certain way and it'll never get that way. Because by the time it gets there, it's changed. <laughs> the third is come with unveiled faith seeking truth. And I'm going to show you that verse. And what you have to do is you got to realize you got to come with that excuse. Do you realize excuses are like feet? <laughs> Everybody got some. And if you keep them covered up long, they all stink. You got to wash them. And what happens is, you know what? I, I hear The problem is, I've heard people where you just think it's okay to rinse your feet off. You don't have to wash them. And I remember hearing someone say, you just rinse them. I'm like, rinse what? You rinse your fruit. You rinse grapes. You wash your feet. You got to wash them. Put some soap on those things. And they were like, well, don't just soap. And this is a kid. This is a middle school kid. The soap just runs off. I'm like, baby, keep your shoes on. Keep your shoes on. Don't take your shoes off. Don't take your shoes off. Because if you think it's run off, that's enough to get you straight. Keep your, keep your shoes on. And the reality is, that's what we started doing. You just keep your shoes on. Because you're not doing what you need to do. You just rather make excuses. You need to be coming with a willing heart. You know, so often I, I deal and talk to people who are struggling with some type of addiction and they are all kinds of things off the gamut. And they'll say, you know, I got this problem, I got this problem. But you know what? They don't have a willingness in their heart to do anything about it. They want to talk about the problem. And they even acknowledge that they got the problem, but they're not willing to change it. Jesus. So what happens is it just becomes natural. Yes. You know, like that extra 15 pounds? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just buy bigger pants? Just buy, you just buy pants with elastic? Stretch. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes. You know, sure just stretch. Stretch, you know, every leggings were the next big thing. Like, so what happened? You just you don't deal with it. You just you just stretch with it. You just stretch with it, or you just don't talk about some of those things. Yeah. You just deal with it. And last, you gotta have a want to. One of the things I've learned with running the bridge program, and it's been a tough something, but I think I'm finally there, Charday. Renee, I'm there. Eric, Phyllis, I'm there. It's taken me a couple years to get here. And I have realized I can't make nobody want to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And guess what, Dawn? I fired myself from trying. Amen. Amen. I fired myself because I realized I wanted stuff more for people than they did. I'm willing to fight for people more than they were. And I realized, hold up, that's crazy. I don't do that anymore. 
And when people show me where their want to is, I let them settle there. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's hard sometimes, but I can't make people want better. I can't make people want to do right. I can't make people want to choose Jesus. Mm -mm. I can't make people. I don't anymore. I fired myself from that. A sec Second Corinthians 3.18, the living uh, Bible, it says, but we Christians have no veil over our faces. We can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. And as the spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like him. Your life should be like a mirror. You should be reflecting who he is. And you got to ask yourself, does your, behavior, your current behavior, do your habits reflect him or do they reflect you? All right, Lord. Who is your life? Who's your mirror putting on display with your behavior? Amen. Mm. Amen. Those addictions we talked about earlier, who's on display? Because if I'm not mistaken, if you are in Christ Jesus, you've said your life is not your own. That you've been bought with the price. So if you've been bought with the price, why is it okay for you to not do what's required for that treasure to reflect him. How do we justify the things that we do? How do we justify disobedience when he was the ultimate sacrifice? When I look into the mirror of your life, do I see Jesus? When I listen into the mirror of your conversations, do I hear Jesus? If I were to look through the blinds at your house at night, but what you're watching on TV, what you're listening to on the radio, what you're putting in your body, would I see Jesus? Or would I see hypocrisy? Because you know how the enemy masquerades as light? Problem is, so are a lot of Christians. We know how to speak Christianese. But we don't want to be like Christ. We know how to go to church, but we don't want to be to church. We want to receive love, but we don't want to give love. Amen. Why? Because we've chosen to be fleshy. We've chosen carnality. We've chosen comfort. We've chosen our will over his will. And you say, well, no, I haven't done that. If you adapt it, and are sitting down in a bed of addictions and you're okay with that? You have. You have. John 8, 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So are you free or are you addicted? That's kind of like being kind of pregnant. Either you is or you ain't. Are you free or are you addicted? Are you a mirror of him or are you a mirror of you? Who's on display? Next week, we're going to be talking about are you all in your feelings? Oh. 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 Really? <laughs> Are you all in your feelings? Oh. 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 And what I'm calling this is are your feelings fighting your faith? Mm -hmm. And we have five more weeks, y'all, to close out before we get ready to go into the holiday season. And I just want you guys to be praying because we're going to Take a couple minutes and let God do some work here. But I want you to hear about what we're going to be talking about over the next weeks. And I want you to be, I want you to commit one to be here yourself. But I want you to be praying about who needs to be coming. And I was going through these messages with Eric this morning. And he just was sitting across the table laughing. So next week is, are you, are your feelings fighting your faith? The next week after that, we're going to be, because God says we need to break these addictions down a little bit. Because we got to get over the drugs and the alcohol and the smoking piece because it's bigger than that. So next week, we're going to be dealing with the feeling addiction. 
The next week we're going to be doing the thought addiction. And it's called shrinking due to stinking thinking. <laughs> Are you shrinking due to stinking thinking? Are you shrinking your dreams? Are you shrinking your vision? Are you shrinking your joy? Are you shrinking your relationship circles? We go in there. The third one is activity addictions. <laughs> and guess what that's called, y'all? Going nowhere really fast. Mm. The next week, we're going to hit the reenactment addictions. And we're going to be talking about breaking the pain cycle. Mm. And that last week, we're going to be de oh, dealing with the will addictions. And that's overcoming the control freak in you. Mm. So we're going all the way in. And you need to be ready. Because here's the thing, you know, everybody wants to talk about having 2020 vision for January. But you're going to have the same thinking 2019 vision if nothing don't change. If you're still looking through the same glasses, through the same lens, going into the new year, the new year don't make you different. Same baggage. Same problems, same issues. And then you're going to be talking about, oh, yeah, this is my year. Woohoo! Ain't you been saying that for the last 20? <laughs> last 12? You can't even remember the goals you set in January 2019. Talk about, I'm ready for my next step. <laughs> my thoughts are this. If we're going to be in Christ Jesus, we should be moving forward. Yes. If, we should be, if we're going to be in Christ Jesus, our life should be putting him on display. Amen. If we're going to be in Christ Jesus, there should be transformation Amen. happening from the inside out. Amen. I don't care about what all is going on on the outside. What's happening in your heart? Amen. What's happening in your heart? <laughs> she cut that off for me. I've asked Phyllis. I've asked